For years, Texas had a reputation as a tough law and order state. But nothing could have been farther from the truth. It ran a revolving door prison system, and it turned loose a monster. You know, sometimes at night, when I think about what he did to these people, these innocent people, I, I can't sleep at night. I'm not a tough cop. It still affects me. Retired Deputy U.S. Marshal Parnell McNamara, now the sheriff of McLennan County, Texas, can't forget a sadistic sexual serial killer like no other, Kenneth Allen McDuff. Hello, I'm investigative reporter Robert Riggs, the creator of the True Crime Reporter podcast. I'm here to take you inside the crime scene tape of the Broomstick Murders. On Saturday night of August 6, 1966, three teenagers parked their car at a high school baseball field to listen to music near Fort Worth, Texas. The top 20 hit that month was Summer in the City by The Lovin' Spoonful. Dressing so fine and looking so pretty, sang the band's leader, John Sebastian. 16-year-old Edna Louise Sullivan, a pretty blue-eyed high school basketball player known as Louise, playfully wrote her name in mascara on the car window. Her boyfriend, 17-year-old Robert Brand, the car's owner, and his cousin, 16-year-old Mark Dunham, who was visiting from California, shared in the fun with Louise. But the idyllic moment was about to turn into a nightmare. 20-year-old Kenneth McDuff, not long out of prison on parole for a string of burglaries, snuck toward the teenager's car. 18-year-old Roy Dale Green followed McDuff carrying a broken piece of a wooden broomstick handle. McDuff had told his running buddies that, quote, I'm going to kill somebody. I've killed people before and I like it. He gripped a 38 caliber revolver and threw open the car door. Our story about how McDuff randomly executed three innocent teenagers begins in Rosebud, a small farming community located in central Texas. A large water tower with rose blooms painted on it and a similar sign at the city limits welcomes visitors. Every home used to have a rose bush in the front yard. They have long wilted in the shadow of Kenneth McDuff. Fran Hargrove is a lifelong resident and the town librarian. Kenneth was evil. He was the uh, personified evil. You look in his face, you, you see what was going on, and we discovered that when he killed those three people. When he killed those three kids, that is when we first realized what Kenneth really was. Kenneth McDuff was the town bully. His high school principal described McDuff as a habitual liar and a thief. His mother, Addie, thought her son could do no wrong. A hefty, gruff woman, she was known as Pistol Packin' Mama McDuff. Hargrove recalls Addie's reaction when Kenneth got kicked off the school bus for misbehaving. Her reputation really came about early on with that pistol. She was called Pistol Packin' Mama. Kenneth got kicked off the bus. They lived out in the country at that time. Uh, at that time, the bus drivers, they could kick them off anywhere. I mean, they may be walking miles away, but they had that authority to do it. So the next day when the bus came by, they weren't going to pick Kenneth up, and she was standing in the road with a gun and stopped him. And she was demanding that he get on the bus. Well, the bus driver just took off. Tellers at the local bank dreaded waiting on the pistol-packing mama. Miss McDuff came in, and she looked at her death set, and... There was a stapler and a, a scotch tape dispenser. And she said, I don't know if it was both or one, but she said, I've always wanted this. And she picked it up and put it in her purse. And, and this young lady said, why would you let her do it? And she said, my gosh, she said she has a gun in her purse. She carries it, she has it there. People were scared enough in town of her uh, that they reacted that way. I learned that McDuff's home was a house of horrors. 
J.A. McDuff, a concrete finisher by trade, was a quiet man around town, but behind closed doors he would explode in violent rages at Kenneth McDuff's four sisters and a brother. For example, he once punished a daughter by hanging her from a barn rafter with a rope tied to her wrist, her feet dangling off the ground. J. A. McDuff made the family watch as he horsewhipped his daughter and then ordered Addie to wipe her bloody wounds with rubbing alcohol. But J. A. and Addie put their son Kenneth on a pedestal. Addie claimed he was the most loving out of all of her children. McDuff got away with molesting his youngest sister for years, according to a family member and U.S. Marshals. I uncovered that McDuff raped a high school classmate, cut her throat, and left her for dead in a ditch. Her family was too afraid to come forward. McDuff's impregnated victim secretly gave birth to his daughter. That would fit a pattern of how he treated women. I mean, there, there was something going on in that household with women that, that caused him to just absolutely snap and want to hurt him badly and kill him and torture him. After a student athlete at the high school stood up to the bully and, as they say in Texas, whipped the snot out of him, McDuff dropped out in the ninth grade. In 1965, at age 19, McDuff received a 42-year prison sentence for a string of burglaries and robberies that he called a prank. But in Texas' revolving door prison system at that time, McDuff walked out on parole after serving only nine months and two weeks. He started hanging out with Roy Dale Green, who poured concrete with him at his father's business. McDuff boasted to Green that killing a woman is like killing a chicken. They both squawk. And Addie McDuff confided to a neighbor that Kenneth was always choking her chickens to death with a stick. McDuff kept a broken broomstick in the back seat of his car. On August 6th of 1966, as they drove to Fort Worth together, McDuff bragged to Green about killing women and sex, sex capades, he called it. Gary Laverne, the author of Bad Boy from Rosebud, The Murderous Life of Kenneth McDuff, says Roy Dale Green was the perfect accomplice. He was dim-witted and weak-willed. And McDuff understood that. I mean, it's not like McDuff picked out a high school graduate to bring along. I mean, it, he wanted to impress people with his brutality, and anyone with an ounce of uh, intelligence or education would not have been impressed. McDuff was a sexual predator always on the hunt. When he spotted the three teenagers that night parked at the empty high school baseball field, McDuff pulled a revolver out of the glove compartment and told Green to follow him with a jagged broomstick. McDuff surprised the teens and threatened to shoot them if they didn't get out of the car. He put the three teens into the trunk of Robert Brand's car, got behind the wheel, and told Green to follow him in his car. McDuff stopped at a remote area off a farm-to-market road. He ordered Louise Sullivan to get out of the trunk. Roy Dale Green locked the girl in the trunk of McDuff's car. McDuff turned to the two boys still inside the trunk and told Roy Dale Green, We can't leave any witnesses. I'm going to have to knock them off. The boys begged McDuff not to hurt them. Green thought McDuff was kidding. Until McDuff shot Robert Brand twice at point-blank range in his ear and forehead. Mark Dunham tried to shield himself. McDuff shot him through the arm, then grabbed the boy by his hair, put the muzzle of his revolver against Dunham's head, and coolly squeezed off a round. More than 50 years later, Roy Dale Green vividly recalls the slayings. This boy in front of me go like this, yes, cover his head, and that's what I did too, I turned away. And every time I'd take my hand off the eyes to look, he'd shoot. And you could smell gunpowder and blood when he got through. McDuff couldn't get the trunk lid to shut against the two bodies. So he backed the car into a fence, and they drove away with the 16-year-old Louise locked inside his trunk. Down the road, McDuff took her out of the trunk, raped her in the back seat, ordered Green to then rape her, which he did. McDuff then raped her again and violated her with a jagged broomstick. 
Next, Macduff made Louise lie down on the gravel road in front of his car. He straddled the 16-year-old girl's chest and mashed the broomstick across her throat. Sullivan flailed her arms and kicked as Macduff choked her to death. He told Green to hold her legs. It's got to be done, he said. When Sullivan went limp, Green grabbed her hands. Macduff grabbed her feet. They heaved her body over a fence. Macduff dragged her through the brush and choked her once more just to make sure Louise Sullivan was dead. They covered her lifeless body with bushes, then drove back to Rosebud, stopping along the way at a gas station for soft drinks. Back in Rosebud, Macduff buried the gun beside Green's home and spent the night there. The next day, a Sunday morning, Macduff's brother summoned his father and siblings to an emergency family meeting in Rosebud at his home. Today, a power pole stands where they thoroughly washed evidence out of the passenger compartment of Macduff's car and sprayed clean the underside of his vehicle. Macduff's father poked a stick in a fire as he burned the trunk's carpet liner to destroy any trace that Louis Sullivan had been held inside it. Back in Fort Worth, Robert Brand never came home. His sister Fran says their father became concerned. Because Robert was always home in time. No matter what, he was always home. And Dad didn't rest till his kids were home. Jack Brand thought his son might have eloped with Louise, but when he didn't show up, he set out to find his missing son. Olaf Fisherman found the teenager's abandoned car with the limbs of the bullet-riddled bodies of Robert Brand and cousin Mark Dunham sticking out of the open trunk. Fran Brown, Robert's sister, will never forget what happened next when Sheriff Lon Evans drove up to their house. I think it was Lon Evans brought Dad over to my mother and father's house because we got the phone call to wait there. Don't leave. Uh, he kind of said they had found him. So Dad, a little while, pulled up with Lon Evans. They got out of the car and Dad came over to me and said, we found him. They've both been shot. They're dead. The murders were front page headlines in newspapers across Texas. Retired CBS News anchor Bob Schieffer, then a 29-year-old police beat reporter for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, covered what quickly became known as the broomstick murders. The shock value of suddenly you find two people shot to death in the trunk of a car, kids. I mean, these were teenagers. These weren't grown people. And, uh, and, and killed, uh, shot at point black point range. Schieffer had just returned from a combat assignment covering the Vietnam War. Nothing had prepared him for this. Uh, it really upset people, and it really, it really, uh, it really bothered the community. I, I still remember it because I think it's the worst thing I ever saw. Uh, really, when you come right down to it, I mean, I saw those bodies, and and you know, when you're on the police beat, you see a lot of death. Uh, but I'd never seen anything that that matched the cruelty of what uh, Macduff did. It's just that I hope I never do see it again. When Macduff's accomplice, Roy Dell Green, heard the news on the radio, he broke down on the spot. His mother told him to turn himself in. Schieffer witnessed Green's confession. Lon Evans was the sheriff of Tar Tarrant County. We called him the high sheriff. He was also a, a, a great source of mine. And the police reporters in those days, uh, we, we, the, after you'd been there for a while, uh, and they began to trust you, they would uh, let you go with them when they went to investigate things. I, I always remember on the night police beat, the press office, and I was the only reporter in the, in the building at, at that time of night, if the detectives had a call for a, uh, what they knew was going to be a serious crime, I'd actually ride out to the, to the crime scene with them. One of the things that people just shake their heads when I tell them about is often when they would take confessions from people, they would call me in 
and let me type the confession. The reason what was good for them is I could type better than the uh, detectives could, and so that was a help to them. And what was good for me under the libel laws in those days, you couldn't uh, use someone's name unless they'd been charged in a peace justice court. So that would be the next day uh, when I was working at nights. And so by taking the confessions, uh, I would then sign the confession as a witness and I could use the person's name in the paper. And uh, that's why you would often see in those stories, told a Star-Telegram reporter. Uh, that's, that's how we did that. To the best of your recollection, tell me about uh, the emotions of Green when he's confessing. What a contrast. And you wrote about a contrast between the two. What was interesting about these two is how totally different they were. Uh, just from the standpoint of Macduff wasn't about to tell anybody about anything. Uh, he, he wouldn't give you details. He wouldn't even acknowledge that he was there. Green, on the other hand, uh, couldn't, couldn't hold it in. He, he was a person who was easily swayed, who was, you know, he was the kid in the high school that if everybody else wanted to do something, he went along with them. I mean, it never seemed to be his idea. And he, uh, he obviously was, was totally afraid uh, of Macduff. Uh, but uh, they were two absolutely different people. Sheriff Parnell McNamara recalls his father's reaction to the murders. T.P. McNamara, then the deputy U.S. Marshal in Waco, was friends with Falls County Sheriff Brady Pamplin, who had a long history of trouble with the McDuffs and Rosebud. And I remember Sheriff Pamplin talking to my father about this brutal murder that had just happened, that this guy named Macduff you know, once you hear that name uh, associated with a murder, you don't forget Macduff. And he already had a reputation. He had a reputation as just being a, a low-life thug and a punk. I remember Brady Pamplin's hands shaking and his voice trembling when he was telling my father how Macduff had killed these three teenagers, and especially the little girl and putting a broomstick across her throat after he had used it on her and brutally sexually assaulted her and had her down on her back in a gravel road. And I remember the sheriff shaking and saying, T.P., he broke her neck just like you would kill a possum. And I remember how sick I was and my father, you know, his reaction I know that either one of those men would have killed Macduff at the drop of a hat, and so would I. You know, I, I was a guard. I didn't have a badge. I didn't have credentials, but I had a gun. And, you know, to hear something like that happen in, in such a brutal way it just made me sick, and I never forgot it. And then he shows up, and there's a gunfight or a standoff. Exactly. The night after the brutal murders... Macduff comes back home the night of the murders, but the next night he has a date with a young girl that lived in Bremond. Seems unbelievable. Unbelievable. Triple murder and he's out on a yeah, date. Yeah, and he's out on this date like nothing ever happened. Sheriff Brady Paplin and his son Larry, who would later become the sheriff, surprised Macduff when he took his date home. They captured Macduff during a running gun battle. And to this day, Pamplin regrets that he didn't put a slug into Macduff when he had the chance. Do you have any sense of how this man became so mean and evil? Well, as I indicated, in his mother's mind, he could do absolutely no wrong. The man, in my opinion, had no sign of a conscience. And he got his thrills from terrorizing, uh, holding a person in bondage, inflicting pain, torture. Schieffer rode to Rosebud with the Tarrant County Sheriff to arrest McDuff for the murder. In those days when there was um, an important prisoner to be transferred to the Fort Worth jail, Sheriff Lon Evans would generally uh, 
drive down in a patrol car with his deputy, uh, uh, Earl Brown, who was the number two guy in the sheriff's department, and, and bring them back himself. And uh, on this particular case, uh, I had asked him if I could go with him uh, to pick up uh, these people after this story broke. And so uh, we did drive down there. On the way back, and, and we were in the car for about two and a half hours uh, with McDuff, he expressed no interest in any conversation about anything. Uh, at one point, the only thing, uh, when people would ask him a question, he would just nod or act like he was asleep or uh, just, I've never seen anybody quite like him. He, he showed no remorse. Uh, he showed no hesitancy about uh, any of it. He just sat there and, and said he wanted to see a lawyer. And uh, uh, I, I came to, to realize I, I had never seen anyone like this. Or dealt, and I'd been on the police beat for a long time at that point. Uh, he, uh, he was a monster. He was a monster. I don't think he had any conscience, and I remember somebody saying at the time, uh, if there was ever a reason for the death penalty, it was Kenneth Allen McDuff. He personified that, and uh, it, it just made you feel uneasy, really, to be around him. Texas was still reeling from a mass murder that had unfolded on live television in Austin a few days earlier. As I remember it, the only thing that McDuff talked about on that ride back home, somehow the, the shooting at the University of Texas Tower, Charles Whitman had taken a rifle and gone to the top of the tower and started shooting people down on the campus below. Uh, and it was a horrendous uh, day. Uh, this happened, uh, probably a couple of weeks after that, and somehow it came up as we were driving back, and McDuff volunteered, that guy must have really been crazy. But that's, that's the only thing uh, that he said uh, all, all the way back. And uh, even when he got back and, uh, and, and was jailed, he refused to talk to anybody. Uh, the sheriff told me that uh, he had gone by his cell to see him the next morning and said, good morning, and he said, go to hell, and turned around. And uh, he never talked to anybody about anything throughout that time. Green agreed to help find the body of Louise Sullivan. Sheriff Evans brought Green to the scene, and Schieffer was there covering the search. The search, uh, because they knew by then that obviously there was, there was this girl was missing. They hadn't found her. But uh, there were more than a hundred law officers uh, on that search, uh, and and it, all of this was taking place uh, place in all of this was taking place in in pretty rugged country. It was pasture land, but there was a lot of brush there, uh, that sort of thing. It, it was not easy, and uh, they spent. Uh, it was not until I guess the second day that they they finally were able to uh, uh, to find find her body and. He, uh, Green, had agreed to take them and, and show them where she was buried. And they went out the first day and took him out there. And he had kind of a meltdown of sorts and, and couldn't seem to find his way. And they, uh, they took him back to the jail and he, he drew some crude maps of where he thought the body was. And they used those maps to uh, finally find her body. Green was the prosecution's star witness against McDuff during an eight-day-long capital murder trial. He nervously fidgeted and testified in a barely audible voice about the gruesome details of the triple slaying. Addie McDuff sat front and center in the packed courtroom, flanked by Kenneth's brother and sisters. I just thought he had the coldest, coldest eyes I've ever seen in my life. Mean. Mean looking to me. Robert Brand's sister came to trial for one day, but never came back, because Addie McDuff threatened her family outside the courtroom. And she was talking so loud. She said, he's not guilty of this. She said, I will get each and every one of them. Well, that kind of scared me. I was horrified. I said, just don't listen to her. 
Macduff took the stand in his own defense. He claimed Green did the killings and was trying to frame him. But the contrast between Macduff and the pathetic personality of his accomplice undermined his defense. The nine-man, three-woman jury, which had shed tears during Green's testimony, didn't believe Macduff. They deliberated for four hours. Macduff, wearing a black suit and tie, casually waved to his family as deputies escorted him into the courtroom to hear the verdict. The judge asked Macduff to stand as the verdict was read. Macduff replied, I'll take it sitting down. Macduff remained stone-faced and showed no emotion, just as he had done throughout the trial. The jury found him guilty of the murder of Robert Brand and sentenced him to die in the Texas electric chair known as Old Sparky. Roy Dell Green pleaded guilty to murdering Edna Louise Sullivan. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Later, he was transferred to the Ross State Mental Hospital after seeing visions and hearing voices that kept him awake at night. Green was paroled in 1979 after serving 13 years of his 25-year sentence for his part in the Broomstick Murders. A rosebud heaved a collective sigh of relief when Macduff was sent to Texas death row to await his execution. But they had not heard the last of Kenneth Allen Macduff. In 1989, Sheriff Larry Pamplin, the lawman who had helped capture Macduff with his father for the Broomstick Murders 23 years earlier, received a shocking phone call. Macduff, the serial killer, had been released on parole, freed to kill. And I said, mark my word. I said, I don't know if it'll be three days, three weeks, or three months, but I promise you bodies are fixing to start showing up. And I think it was three days later. Our five-part television docuseries called Breed to Kill picks up the story from there. You can watch the series on Fox Nation streaming as we expose a corrupt parole system, conduct a nationwide manhunt for McDuff, and search for countless missing women. It is a scandal like none ever seen in Texas history. You can also listen to the first season of my True Crime Reporter podcast, which inspired the Freed to Kill TV series. True Crime Reporter is listed on all of the major podcast channels. It is a journey into darkness.